Now, I throw this in just as a little sidebar. And some of us, some of you, we talked about this yesterday in lab. Here is a single motor neuron. Now, notice that the relationship is not one neuron to one muscle fiber, but the relationship is one motor neuron to multiple muscle fibers. We call this unit a motor unit. Now, in a muscle bundle, there are thousands and thousands of muscle fibers. And so what you will have is a situation where as the muscle bundle, as we look at the whole muscle bundle, we'll start to see more and more motor units. So here is a single motor unit. Here is a second motor unit interspersed together. To get maximum contraction, then you would want to contract all muscle fibers, which would mean that they would all be innervated, and you'd have multiple motor neurons. But again, the relationship <coughs> is not one to one. Okay, here's an ex here is a look at a uh, motor in plate, muscle fibers, and a motor neuron. Here are muscle fibers. And you can see the striated appearance of the muscle fibers. What is this? That's a motor neuron. And these are the terminal endings. And so what does that become right there? Motor end plate, right? That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's a pretty cool photograph. Now, what happens after the action of the tissue reaches the motor neuron and we get then an action potential in the muscle fiber? Sodium starts to rush into that muscle fiber, right? What's the next event that happens? Well, here's where it gets kind of interesting. This is a muscle fiber, right? <clears throat> this constitutes the what? The muscle, the muscle cell. This is one muscle cell. What does the blue represent? Sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the muscle equivalent of the endoplasmic reticulum. Look at how it is distributed through that muscle fiber. What are these? These are the myofibrils, the actin and myosin, right? And if this were a Z line right here, and this were a Z line right here, then that unit across those two Z lines would be a sarcomere, right? Now, what I want to draw your attention to is to a, oh, what are these right here? They're mitochondria. Lots of mitochondria in skeletal muscle? Yes. Yeah, and that's something we'll talk about in a few minutes. But that's not what I want to draw your attention to. I want to draw your attention to this purple element, this purple structure. And they tend to run sarcomere to sarcomere. These are not Z lines. They are called transverse or T tubules. Notice where the T tubule starts. It starts out at the sarcolemma, the membrane of the muscle fiber. And it's a channel or tube that projects into the muscle fiber, perpendicular. The muscle fiber is running this way. The T tubule projects inwards perpendicular to the running of the muscle fiber. And so it creates a labyrinth or a series of channels through the fiber. Can you see that? So if you and I were standing right here, we could enter the T tubule and it would take us down into the muscle fiber. And then if we could make our way out, we would be in the inside of the cell, and we could walk on top of the endoplasmic reticulum, and we could walk down here and take a look at the mitochondria. That would be pretty cool. Okay. Is that Is that like another membrane? It's 
membrane. So if we look at it this way, here would be the plasma membrane. There would be a T-tubule. There would be a T-tubule. So here we would have the Z-lines. Actin. Myosin. So you see these T-tubules, they are membrane. That is a, that is a membrane, right? Now, the reason why this is important is because after we get the action potential in the muscle fiber, that depolarizing wave moves down the membranes of the T-tubule. So that, that action potential is going to be propagated along that T-tubule. And that's going to mean that the action potential ends up deep inside the muscle fiber. It's not just an event that's occurring out here at the surface membrane, but it's actually an event that's occurring also down deep into the fiber along the membranes of the T-tubule. See that? Okay. So action potential in muscle fiber, propagation of action potential along T-tubule. As that happens, located down in this T-tubule, there is a receptor. Okay. It's called a DHP receptor. That DHP receptor is connected to a second protein called our rhinodyne receptor. That rhinodyne receptor is connected to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So here comes the depolarizing wave down the T-tubule. What happens when it hits the DHP receptor? It activates that DHP protein which in turn activates the rhinodyne receptor, which in turn does what here? This is calcium. Opens calcium channel. Now what comes flowing out of the sarcoplasmic particulate? Calcium. So the next step, propagation of action potential on T-tubule, results in the what? Release of calcium from where? From the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what is responsible for the actual opening of those calcium channels from the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Activation by DHP and rhinodyne receptors. What activates the DHP and rhinodyne receptors? The action potential. What caused the action potential? The transmitter substance released by a motor neuron. What caused the release of the transmitter substance by the motor neuron? An action potential coming down the axon of that motor neuron. So, so far, we've got the action potential of the motor neuron causing an action potential of the muscle fiber propagating it down along the T-tubule, which activates the DHP and rhinodyne receptors, which opens the sodium channels, and now the next step is calcium, excuse me, I mean calcium. Calcium enters the muscle fiber. Wait, did you mean calcium instead of sodium? What? Yes. Yeah. Sodium? I said sodium, but I meant calcium. Okay, calcium enters the muscle fiber. Where does the calcium go? To calcium, to component. Is 
that right? Yes. So now the calcium will come out of the sarcoplasmic reticula and bind to troponin. Where is the troponin? In the myofibrils. It's in these, is it in all the myofibrils? What myofibrils? Thin ones. In the thin filament. What does the troponin do when calcium binds to its binding site? Conformational change, lifting tropomyosin. So here we've got then the, tro tro uh, the troponin lifting the tropomyosin off of the thin filament. What is that exposed? Binding sites for the myosin. What is the state of the myosin head? Energized. What two binding sites are on that myosin head? Um, ATP binding site and then active binding site. What's setting on the ATP binding site? ADP, because it's already been energized, right? So here's another view. What is this? That's the plasma membrane, the sarcolemma. What are these openings? T tubules. Opening to the T tubules. What are these? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. What are these? Myofibrils. And what's inside those myofibrils? Thick and thin filaments. Where does the depolarizing wave go? Down the T tubule. Both sides. What's sitting right here between the T tubule and the sarcoplasmic reticulum? The, the DHP and rhinobine receptors. Okay? And so, as a result, what's going to happen to these filaments? They're going to slide across each other as those energized myosin heads fit into the binding sites of the actin, and you get what is called a power stroke. After each power stroke, what happens? So here goes my energized head. It goes from energized, then I get a power stroke. What's the next event that's going to happen to that head? ATP is going to come in, bind. What's that going to do? Release it from the actin, split the ATP, energize the head, and if the next actin binding site is available to it, It'll attach to the next acting binding site, and you'll get a power stroke. And this is happening along all those little myosin heads. Okay. Now, that leaves us with some interesting questions. Where is ATP used in these systems? Well, we know one place it's used on the myosin head. And the pumps that pump the calcium back into It's the used body. on the sodium potassium pumps. And the calcium pump. Used in the calcium pump. Are those main main uses of ATP? So we've got our pumps running, these ion pumps. We've got the power stroke created by energizing the myosin heads. So how great is the expenditure of ATP in these muscle fibers during contraction? Quite a lot. In fact, what generates most of the heat in the body? Contraction of skeletal muscle. And that heat is the extra energy that's left over that's lost as entropy from the ATP reactions that are taking place in these muscle fibers, right? So, we use a great deal of ATP to fund muscle contraction. And this is especially true when the muscle is highly active. So, if you're running, for example, then you're consuming a lot of ATP. Just sitting there, you're consuming significant amounts of ATP as you Jiggle your leg, and as you ride, and as you tie, and as you scratch your head, 
I said that, and what did what did you do, Carlos? Immediately scratched your head. Some kind of reason. So one of the discussions we should have then is what are the sources of ATP to drive muscle contraction? Sources of ATP. Well, source number one is just the ATP that is available residually in the cell. So we'll just put A, I'm just going to put that as just the starting ATP. How much ATP is sitting in that cell residually? Let's put it in terms of seconds. How many seconds of residual ATP do you have to fuel maximal muscle contraction? Two, two seconds. A minute? No. Uh, how many is a few to you? Thirty. Three or four? Three or four? Not bad. Maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of about five seconds. So you have enough ATP, residual ATP, sitting there to fund about five seconds of maximal muscle contraction. That's not going to help much if you're running away from a saber-toothed tiger. You know what they have to say, you don't have to be faster than the tiger. Just faster than the print you're with. Right? But you have about five seconds. So that obviously is not going to cut it. So besides residual ATP, what are our other sources? Well, there's mitochondria, but let's talk about sources that are recruited initially. Well, inside skeletal muscle, you have a molecule called creatine. Okay. Creatine can accept a high-energy phosphate bond. And when that happens, it's converted to creatine phosphate. The actual amount of energy in that creatine phosphate bond is actually slightly higher than the energy in an ATP bond. So it's, so the reaction arrow is favorable to using the phosphate on the creatine to form ATP. Where is the ATP going to come from? Well, after you've used your residual ATP, then you have ADP, right? Which can accept that high energy phosphate to form ATP. How fast is that exchange from high energy phosphate bond on the creatine to high energy phosphate bond on ADP? It's near instantaneous. It's near instantaneous. So as soon as that ADP is produced, it will be recharged to ATP as long as there is a high energy creatine phosphate bond available to it, and the exchange will occur instantaneously. We're not even going to put a time on it if that fast. So how much creatine do we have in our muscles? We have enough. We're doing everything in seconds now. So, so using all, so we've used all of our ATP, and now we're going to start taking energy from creatine phosphate. How much high energy creatine phosphate do we have available to us? 15, 13 seconds. Mm, yeah, something maybe about the 15 second range. Okay. So we might have, uh, we might be up to 15 seconds now. Okay. So now we've got about 20 seconds on the saber tooth tiger. We've exhausted our residual ATP. We've exhausted our storage of high energy phosphates from creatine. 15 seconds enough to get away from the. Maybe if you have a spear. Uh, depends on what's around you, yes. System number three. The P 
DNC. The PNC, that stands for purine nucleotide cycle. And what purine are we talking about? Adenine. So take a look at this. Are we building up ADPs? Yes. We're building up ADPs. So the purine nucleotide cycle allows me to take ADP, which I'm producing a lot of because I'm burning these, I'm oxidizing these. ADP plus ADP goes to ATP plus AMP. So I take a phosphate off of ADP, put it on another ADP, which gives me ATP, but leaves me AMP, which quickly degrades to IMP plus So I can start producing ATPs from the purine nucleotide cycle. How many seconds of energy can I produce from the purine nucleotide cycle? About another five seconds. So now I'm up to what? Now I've got about 25 seconds. Now what? Glycogen lactate system. Or essentially what? Biochemical pathway. Glycolysis. Can you use non-aerobic pathways and run a marathon? Yeah. 
No, in fact, can you run a mile non aerobically? Some people do. Unless you get What could you run non aerobically? Could you run 100 meters? Yeah. Yeah. Could you run 220? Yeah. What's a good 220 time? 20 seconds. 22 seconds? Could you run a 400 meter? Yes. Yeah. I had to. Well, let's add up. You've got a thousand. We'll go higher in. 40, 45, 60, 65 seconds. Can you run four? Can people run 400 meter? So you're telling me that you have enough energy anaerobically to go up fully about 400 meters. And that's about right because 400 meters is considered a what? Sprint. Considered a sprint. It, we're talking world class athletes now. We're not talking couch potatoes like you. My coach cut anybody in 470 seconds. He could run it in. My, no, my coach cut anybody that couldn't run the 470 seconds. And if you're if you're going 70 seconds, then you have to go aerobically. And in order to go aerobically, what do you have to do to breathe? The expenditure of energy. <laughs> well, can, you can't go max. You can't use maximum muscle contractions. So you have to do what? Slow down. But we had to get under 70 seconds. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, if if you're if you're aerob if you're anaerobic, uh -huh. and you're out of ATPs, the only way you can continue moving oh, right. is to slow, slow down. down. Yeah. Well, if you're a runner in a sprint and you're slowing down, you're losing. You're losing. Yeah. If the guy next to you is, and in fact, that's the key to running a marathon too. By the way, if you want to know the strategy of how marathon runner run marathon. But those are the energy systems available to you. It's a strategy. It's a strategy. <laughs> uh, we missed the big trick. What's the strategy? What? That's the trick. That's the strategy. And then oh, how do you, how, what's the strategy? How, how do they do it? Yes. And then you have to go to the strategy. Um, and then you have to It's pretty easy. What you do is. You've got to run. You've got to stay aerobic. You've got to stay aerobic, right? Are there periods of time during the race when you can go anaerobic for brief periods of time? Yes. Yeah. But if you you run the risk, if you go anaerobic for too long, then you're going to fatigue, and that's going to be the end of your race. So you want to run as close to anaerobic as you can without. Being anaerobic, and you want to take your opponent just over the line. You want to stay right here on the line, and you want to take your opponent just over the line. How do you do that? That means you gauge, you first of all, you know when you're aerobic as a runner, and you know right when you go anaerobic. And if you're a trained runner, you physiologically can feel that. You try to gauge when your opposition is running so close to the line that if you take them over, fatigue occurs, they slow down into the race for them. And so it's a real strategy for you to maintain aerobic capacity while you take your competitors anaerobic and force them into anaerobiosis. And that's what world-class marathoners can do. They can gauge exactly where that line is, and they know exactly how long they can step over that line and when they have to get back. Now, the problem is their competitors are world-class runners, too, and they know where they're at. So it's trying to gauge, is he more, if I speed up a little bit, is he likely to go anaerobic and I'm likely to stay aerobic? If that's the case, I'm going to speed up. But what if I miscalculate? I take myself anaerobic. He stays aerobic. He wins. And the differences there are itsy bitsy little differences. What does it take to rebuild your resistance rate to be and all of that to produce a massive If you're if you're at max and you run through these, the only 
thing that's going to allow you to do this is stop. How long? Well, that's interesting. How long does it take you? Um, here's one of the issues you have to deal with right here. If you go anaerobic, you're going to increase ammonia production. What does ammonia do to you? It, what it, it does, but it also has a huge effect on the brain. Now, you guys, when you think of fatigue, you think of peripheral fatigue. You think of all that muscleless fatigue. But a good portion of fatigue is not peripheral, it's central. It's called central fatigue. And what it does is it affects what's called muscle drive. Now, you've all experienced this. I can guarantee you there's times when you've had zero muscle drive, you have been, you're wiped out, and you have done absolutely no exercise whatsoever. Why not play? Jet lag. Jet lag is not about your, the fatigue coming because you've exercised so much. It's coming because you have no central drive. Central meaning central uh, nervous system. Well, ammonia acts on the brain to cut central drive. Have you ever seen pictures of that Swiss woman entering the LA Coliseum at the end of the Olympic marathon? The one she's falling over. Yeah. Yeah. Guess what's doing that to her? Ammonia. She's condition is called hyperammonemia, and she's on the verge of collapse. It's because her plasma ammonia's are sky high. So. She's not going to recover until she what? Stop and gets rid of the ammonia. Well, when you're exercising like that, there's no blood flow to the kidney, so you're not or liver, so you're not converting ammonia to urea. So how do you get rid of the ammonia? Well, some of it comes out in sweat. A lot of it comes out in respiration. A lot of it is converted. Ammonia plus glutamate goes to glutamine. Uh, ammonia can also be sucked up by alanine. So you have a bunch of pathways that allow you to get rid of the ammonia. But point is, if you're continuing to produce it, you're not getting rid of it. You cut central drive, you're toast. So same thing with creatine. Once all the creatine phosphate has been used up, the only way to recharge the creatine is to stop so that you can get, build up the ATP through aerobic respiration to recharge the creatine. Same thing with glycogen and lactate. When you've used up all the glycogen, there's nothing you can do about it until you can get glucose back into skeletal muscle as glycogen again. you got to stop to do that. So if I'm going to run 100 meters, uh, how long before I could successfully? Well, let's do it a little longer. If I run a 400 meters max out and I use up all my anaerobic systems, fuel supplies, how long before I could run another 400 meters? No 400 meter runners in here? Um, could you run another one in five minutes? You go full out. Can you run another one? Full out. Same time in five minutes? No, but not, not any world class runner I know could do that. In fact, huh? In fact, if you look at the Olympics, one of the issues that some runners have is if they're in too many sprint events. And what they need too many is spread over three days. So if you're running, say, 100 meter, 200 meters, and two 220s, can you expect to run another 220 that day? Ain't happening to you. So depending on how much work you've done, it may take hours to days. Hours to days. And so that's why, who was the last sprinter that, uh, oh, what was that girl? <sighs> she was, I think, the American record holder. She was the American record holder, I think, in the 400 meter, but she dropped out of the 400 meter Olympic finals so she could run the 200 meters, even though they weren't run on the same days. 
because she knew if she ran in the 400 meter final, she would not be able to compete at her best in the 200 meter. She had a better shot of winning the gold in the 200 meter, and that's what she did. And that was the matter. She said, I'm not going to be able to compete at my best if I only have a day's rest. So it took her that long to recover. How about swimmers? Was there a girl at this past Olympics that was able to swim the 100 back, and then her next event that day, she won gold for the 200 meter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's one of the issues swimmers have as well. But she was able to do it. But guess what great American swimmer wasn't able to compete in all the events because he just swam himself out of the pool? It wasn't Michael Phelps. Phelps won. It was Lockley. Lockley. Brian Lockley. Lockley, that's right. He swam himself out. You played water polo. You go hard in a game. How long before you can go hard again? I don't know. A while. A while, isn't it? I mean, I'm not talking about jogging. I'm not talking about running 100 meters and then jogging that afternoon. I'm talking about pull out. So is it ammonia or is it like lack of nutrients? When you're in a marathon, you get like a 20-mile wall. Yeah, you do. And that's usually when you're out of glycogen. Hitting the wall usually means that you have used all of your stored liver glycogen, all of your stored muscle glycogen. Now let's talk about this for just a second. Because not all skeletal muscle fibers are created equal. We each have different fiber types. And there are three fiber types we're going to talk about. One fiber type is going to be called slow oxidative fibers. Another name for the slow oxidative fibers are red fibers. An intermediate type is called a fast oxidative fiber. And a third type is called a fast glycolytic. You might also see these referred to as 1, 2A, and 2B. Type 1 fibers, type 2A fibers, and type 2B fibers. Now look at the names of these fiber types. And what, deter what differentiates one fiber from another fiber? The source of their energy. Type 1 fibers primarily use what energy source? Oxidative phosphorylation. Well, which of our five over here is oxidative phosphorylation? The last one. Aerobic respiration, cellular respiration. These use almost extensively aerobic pathways. That means they must have a lot of what? Without even looking, what must they have a lot of? If these are, must have a lot of mitochondria, right? What about uh, good blood supply? Okay. What about their need for oxygen? Very high. What makes them red? Huh? Is it their blood that makes them red? No. What makes... Now, we don't call a turkey red meat and white meat. We call it dark meat and white meat. But what makes the dark meat of a turkey dark meat? Myoglobin. Myoglobin. These oxidative fibers store a molecule called myoglobin. What, why is it called myo? It's in the muscle. What does myoglobin sound like? Hemoglobin. What does hemoglobin do? <coughs> Carries oxygen. What does myoglobin carry? Who's, to whose advantage is it to have extra oxygen stored as myoglobin inside a fiber? An oxidative fiber who uses lots of oxygen would benefit from having myoglobin. What if you don't use oxidation as your primary metabolic pathway? Then does it carry any benefit to you to store myoglobin? No. That's the difference, hence, between dark meat and white meat. Dark meat is high in myoglobin. What part of a turkey has dark meat? Legs. Wings. Right? They're full of 
myoglobin. The turkey gets around contracting muscle weights primarily oxidatively. Turkeys don't run very fast, very far, nor do they fly very fast, very far. Why? Because their muscle fibers in their wings and legs are oxidative. Can a turkey walk a long way, though? Yes. Yes, they can. <laughs> Anybody who's ever hunted the wily turkey will know that they can go a long way if they're not going too fast. Okay. Anybody in here ever shot a turkey? Shot Good for you. <laughs> That's what I like. Shot them dead, huh? Yeah, they're mean. Huh? Did it out of rage? They're mean. If you were you were protecting yourself. You're going to argue that I shot the turkey dead <laughs> as a matter of self-preservation. Yeah. I have a great turkey story. I'll tell you guys sometime. It's a great story. Did you say? I'll remind me of my turkey story sometime. It's a great story. Did you say it was? These were type one A. Now these are type ones. So the slow oxidative primary source of ATP. Oxidating phosphorylation. Mitochondria? Lots. What about capillaries? Lots. What about myoglobin? Boku. What about glycolyt glycolytic enzyme activity? Why don't you want glycolytic enzyme activity? Because they're primarily not glycolytic. They're oxidative. What about rate of fatigue? Slow. How fast are they? Not fast, but in terms of fatigue? Takes a while. Long time. Minus the ATPase activity. Low. Contraction velocity. Slow. What about fiber diameter? Small. The bigger the fiber, the faster the fiber. So these must be small fibers. What about motor unit size? Small. Size of the motor unit innervating fiber? Small. So everything here cries out, I'm small, I'm slow, I'm red, but I can go a long time. <laughs> now let's look at the other extreme, the type 2B. Are they oxidative? No. They're Glycolytic. In fact, these are the ones that use the other sources. Glycolytic, the glycogen lactate pathways, they're gly glycolytically high. They use creatine phosphates, PNCs, purinucleotide cycles. That's what these guys are using. Well, what about ATP production? Well, all of those other four. Here it says glycolysis, but it's glycolysis, it's uh, Creatine phosphate is PNC. It's all those other pathways. How about mitochondria? Why don't you have a lot of mitochondria in these fiber types? Because they're not oxidative. So we don't have to worry about Krebs cycle and ETS. What about capillaries? You don't need much oxygen because you're anaerobic. What about myoglobin content? Low. Hence, they're not red. They're white. How fast can they twitch? Really fast. How big are they? Really big. What about their ATPase activities? Really high. So these are the two extremes. This one right here is an intermediate. It's kind of intermediate between the two extremes. I actually have some pictures of both of these fiber types. These are slices through muscle. Okay, and take a look. When you selectively stain them, this is what you get. Now, what you're staining for is essentially myoglobin content. So here's a muscle, and what are all of these? Myoglobin-rich fibers. They would be type 1s. These are Type 2. They don't have much glycogen. Now, is it true that type 2s are bigger than type 1s? Yeah, take a look at that. Look at that difference. 
Now, are you telling me that if I just took a normal muscle out of you, say your gastrocnemius muscle, I would find a distribution of both type 1s and type 2 fibers in that muscle? Would we all have the same distribution? No. no. Would some of us have a greater ratio of type 1 to type 2s? And others have a greater ratio of type 2s to type 1s? And that's determined genetically? Some of us are faster runners than others because we have more type 2s. Some of us can run further than others because we have more type 1s. Can you convert one type to another? Kind of. It's pretty easy to convert within the type 2 categories. So you could take a type 2B and convert it into a type 2A quite easily. But you really can't convert a type 2 into a type 1, nor can you convert a type 1 into a type 2. Now, is it to your advantage? Suppose I'm a world-class sprinter. Suppose I'm the same bolt. Do I want to be converting a lot of my type 2B fibers to type 2A fibers? No. No, I don't. Because as soon as I do that, I'm going to slow down. Because take a look at what happens as you start comparing them across. They're going to get smaller. They're not going to get slower. Rate of fatigue, you won't fatigue as fast, but that's okay. I'm not interested in fatigue as much as I'm interested in speed. How, could, how would Usain Bolt convert all of his really fast type 2B fibers into 2A fibers? Go longer running. Not quick training, <coughs> what kind of training? <laughs> endurance training. So if he started endurance training, he would, he would be able to run further but he would run slower. So do you think your same bolt when he trains does endurance training? No. no. So how can he train and make sure that he's not doing this conversion right here? So what kind of training do sprinters do? Anaerobic, if they don't, anaerobic training? What's another word for that sort of thing? Circuit training, any other interval, thing? Interval training. interval training. Okay, so that means you're not running for distances. You're not. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start running miles. I'm running very short bursts, very high energy, and it's very important that they do that. If you're an endurance athlete, then you want to endurance train, but not if you're a sprinter. You don't want to endurance train because you can. You can shift these to these, and that's not what you want to. That's why, it's, that's why speed sports, I've always thought it very interesting that there would be some coaches who would endurance train for a speed sport. Yeah, that's awesome. It's crazy. Would it help to hold your breath while you were running? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yes, that's one of the reasons why. Why do the why do the upper arms of endurance uh, athletes or runners, distance runners, get really bigger? No, 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 not endurance, not sprinter. They get really small and like shiny. Because what are what are what are a lot of your sprinters training? Does the upper body mean anything to a sprinter? Let me say that again. Does the upper body, does Usain Bolt train his upper body? No, but they have. Yes, he does. Why? I know, but I'm saying, do distance runners, do distance runners train their upper body? No. Do they lift, for example? No. Do sprinters lift? Yes. 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 Huh? 
that your brother's a sprinter and he lifts. So he builds his upper body. Why does he why does he lift so much as a sprinter? Especially where are most sprints won or lost? At the start. There's very few runners who can lose the start in a winter sprint race at, at World Class. How do you get out of the blocks faster? Upper body. You look at those sprint, you look at Olympic sprinters and look at their upper bodies. They're big. And that's because they lift. If I'm a marathon runner, do I want to lift? Why don't I want to lift? Because that bigger muscle means more weight I have to carry 26 miles. So I don't want an upper body. I don't want any excess weight. I want to be the skinniest, littlest guy that I can be because that means I've got to, I'm going to carry less weight. Less weight better for me. Not a sprinter. A sprinter, those guys are big upper bodies. No. Um, I say that the general rule of thumb is it, it, it's a one-way track. Com you convert glycolytic to oxidative. Now, obviously, you can, you can so train fast. these to be more efficient. But once you start getting my, uh, myoglobin content into them, once you start increasing capillaries into them, that's not really going to reverse. But you can affect, if, suppose I take two athletes, I have two athletes who have exactly the same distribution of muscle fiber. We'll say sprinters. They have exactly the same distribution of type 2B fibers. Same size, same weight, same everything. They're identical twins. We'll put it this way. Two identical twin spreaders. Will training, if one trains properly for sprinting and the other doesn't train, will the one who trains be able to run faster? Yes. Even though he has exactly the same distribution of fibers and the whole bit. Yes. Why? Yes. What does training, what, when somebody says they're training, what does that mean physiologically? It makes the fibers more efficient. More efficient. Uh, it's the efficiency. Maybe a little bit. That's not what training really is. When you talk about training, you're talking primarily about two things. You're talking about modifying your respiratory capacities. So training is not about muscle as much as it's about respiratory tract. Second of all, what training does, does affect muscle. It affects enzyme systems. Training alters the enzyme systems so that you get different isoforms. And so if I'm a sprinter, I, what isoform do I want, say, for ATPase? The fastest, most efficient isoform. If I'm not training, do I care if I have the fastest, most efficient isoform for every day? So what training does is it alters enzyme isoforms and it alters respiratory capacity. That's what training does. And so all things being equal, the one who's trained will be faster because they have different enzyme isoforms, and better aerobic capacities. And that's the difference between winning a gold medal and being a reasonably fast college sprinter. How is it that training in lost student environments like all the Kenyans helps them all? Oh, there's all sorts of little things about that because are they also interested in training in such a way that they build up myoglobin content, red blood cell content? Think we talk in here about blood doping, right? Where you, you take a pint of blood out, spin it, spin it down, put the red blood cells back in. Got Lance Armstrong in trouble because he was doing that. Is there a way you could do that naturally? Yeah. How could you build your red cell count? Don't you train at elevation? So if I train at elevation, is my fat going to be higher than if I train at sea level? Yes. Yes, it is. So, but it's not, you know how, what the real good people do? I'm not talking about the ones who can afford chambers. Train at sea level, live at elevation. So if you had enough money, you were a world-class uh, athlete, you would train, you do all your training in Los Angeles. Well, no, air's bad there. Um, Seattle, too much rain, too humid. Uh, Arcata, California, 
You train in Arcadia, California, and then you get in your private jet and fly to Denver. I live in Denver. So you live at elevation with train and sea level. That's the most efficient way. But, well, think, if you're living at, at, uh, at elevation, what, what adaptation do you have for blood oxygen carrying capacity? You increase red blood cell count. What happens to your heart if you live at elevation? It's a little bigger, a little stronger. <laughs> but, but why not train at elevation and why train at sea level? Because at sea level, you maximize oxygen capacity because you have more oxygen at sea level. And that improves your aerobic capacity. So you want all the blood advantages of elevation, you want all the respiratory advantages of sea level. Now, what if you can't afford to travel like that? Have a chamber. And so you sleep in a chamber set to elevation. So you spend eight or 10 hours a day, essentially, in a chamber with the uh, uh, atmospheric pressure. So then how come USC is better than the Air Force Academy? What do you mean they're better? <laughs> Almost every sport. Well, let me see. If I, had, if I had a pilot in an F-15, do I want the linebacker from the Air Academy, or do I want the linebacker from USC? <laughs> better is better. And frankly, I think USC, they didn't show me anything this year. <laughs> what did they show me? I mean, really. I seem to remember, I seem to remember the USC-Oregon game. The last I saw was the back end of a duck going down, and Bobby drove him on his horse saying, who was that duck? <laughs> Yeah, I saw I saw Blake Kiffin over on the sideline saying, with junk feet running right after him, saying, if you get the license plate of that duck that just 